Welcome everyone, we're so glad to have you. So let's get started. My name is Tessa and thank you again for joining us tonight at Sue's Local Friends, 150 years of dinosaur discoveries in the Denver Basin. I'm Tessa from the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and I am going to be your virtual host this evening. As you watch the presentation, go ahead and put your questions and comments in the chat. So even though we won't answer them immediately, I have my paper and pencil at the ready and I will be writing them down. Our presenter tonight is Dr. Joe Serdich, who's the Associate Curator of Dinosaurs here at the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. Joe grew up in the Denver area and volunteered at the museum through high school before pursuing a professional career in paleontology. And his research focuses on dinosaurs and their ecosystems during the late Cretaceous. He is one of the primary researchers in the Madagascar Paleontology Project and is also working on several projects searching for the first latest Cretaceous dinosaurs in Africa. Closer to home in the Rocky Mountain West, Joe leads the Laramidia Project. So welcome, Dr. Serdich. We're so happy to have you with us. Yeah, thank you so much, Tessa. Thank you all for joining me tonight. I'm really excited to share dinosaurs. As a dinosaur nerd myself, I can't get enough of them. So getting an opportunity to talk dinosaurs for a full 45 minutes is a dream come true for me. Um, so tonight, I'm really excited to share with you uh, the research that we've been doing here at DMNS uh, recently, but also dig a little bit deeper into the past and look at some of the fossils uh, that have been found here in Colorado and in the local Denver metro area, uh, really for the past 150 or more years. Um, this scene, if you dig in and look closely, uh, is full of little cool details. And so even though I'm a dinosaur paleontologist, I work with lots of other scientists, including geologists and paleobotanists and specialists on mammals, and they're all represented in this scene. So if you look down here, there's a little mammal scurrying past this uh, little stump. There are birds, there are beautiful plants all around. There are even turtles and mollusks and other things in this scene. So this really represents the research that we do here at DMNS. And as we go through this, even though I'm talking mostly about dinosaurs, remember that this is not just a dinosaur talk, this is a paleo talk. So we're located here in the Rocky Mountain West. Denver is that big star, or the Denver Metro Front Range area. And I would argue that this big oval area represents some of the, the best places in the world to hunt for uh, really the history of life on Earth. And this extends up into Canada and down into Mexico, but really the Rocky Mountain region uh, centered on Denver is where you want to go if you want to look for fossils. And that includes all of these yellow stars where our scientists, not just me, but our other curators have gone looking for fossils here in the Rocky Mountain West. So each of these yellow stars represents a place where we've gone out to dig fossils or worked with a partner that's digging fossils. And all of these fossils have come back to Denver for research. So we're putting together a big, big puzzle on how life evolved through time here in the Rocky Mountain West. And you'll see this picture throughout this talk. So this is a, a satellite view of Denver. You can see Denver down here in the lower left portion, all the suburbs of Denver wrapping out, including out into the Eastern Plains, up north to Longmont, down south to Littleton and Centennial. And that's because this picture captures most of the, the big discoveries that have happened in the region really for the past 150 years. And that includes a strip of discoveries right along the mountains that are Jurassic in age. And then Denver itself is split by what we call the KPG or KT boundary when dinosaurs go extinct. And you'll see dinosaurs from right before dinosaurs disappear throughout the Denver metro area. But before we do that, the teacher in me has to show you where we are in time. I'm teaching a class up at CSU and I've been making my students look at this slide over and over and over. This is the geologic time scale. So the one on the left shows you all of earth time going back from 4.6 billion years ago with the creation of the earth all the way to today at the top. And the part we're interested in is called the Mesozoic. So this green box on this. So we're gonna zoom in to the top part of this. This is when complex animal life appears on earth. This is called the Phanerozoic. And we're just gonna focus on what we call the Mesozoic. This is what we call dinosaur time. And that really starts about halfway through the Triassic period and extends all the way to the end of the Cretaceous when dinosaurs disappear. I'm gonna flip that. And this is something you'll see throughout this talk. So the top of the screen 
shows geologic time. So the numbers at the top are millions of years ago. And then I've put dinosaur time on here. So we're gonna be looking at different points in dinosaur time, starting in the middle part of the Triassic and going all the way to the end of the Cretaceous. And then that yellow part over there is what we call the age of mammals. Although our curator of ornithology of birds here at the museum, Garth Spellman and I argue that the Cenozoic is still the age of dinosaurs because there are at least twice as many birds still alive today as there are mammals alive. Um, so it's still the age of dinosaurs in our mind. But this is the age of mammals. And given that it's the 10 year anniversary of our, of our big discovery of snow mass, I'll represent that here as the little tiny end of this bar about 100,000 years ago is when we had mastodons and mammoths here in the front range of Colorado and up into the Rocky Mountains and places like Snowmass and Aspen. So that's the discovery that we made 10 years ago, but we're going deeper in time. And to do that, we have to go all the way back to the beginning when dinosaurs first appear and that's in the Triassic. So about 215 to 210 million years ago, Colorado has a really nice glimpse into the Triassic. But to understand the Triassic, we have to look at where Colorado was. So this is what uh, the world looked like about 220 million years ago. Um, this is our best guess based on geologic information that's preserved in rocks on the seafloor and also on land. And as you can see, most of the continents are united into this big C-shaped supercontinent that we call Pangaea. So dinosaurs appear on the scene when we have Pangaea. And this is North America in the upper left. So this is Canada, Mexico, and the United States. And Colorado is right in this region. We're gonna zoom in on that. So here is North America with the states and Canadian provinces drawn over the top. And Colorado is right here with mountains. So this is a time period when we still had what we called the ancestral Rocky Mountains. This was a Permian aged mountain group. Uh, so the dinosaurs in Colorado were living among a very similar setting, a very mountainous setting, just like today. And if we zoom in on the Four Corners region, so here's Colorado in the upper right of this picture, you can see these ancestral Rockies. And so whenever you get mountain uplift, you're also getting erosion and deposition. And the best places to find dinosaurs from this time period are down out of the mountains in these lowland river environments. So these big swamps and rivers in places like Northwestern New Mexico, uh, Eastern and Northeastern Arizona, and all of Eastern Utah. But there are dinosaurs in the Rocky Mountain or the ancestral Rocky Mountain region of Colorado as well. This is a time period when dinosaurs were just little bit players on the scene. So this is a reconstruction of a uh, ferocious looking crocodile uh, lion relative. It's not a true crocodile, it's called a phytosaur. Uh, chasing after other little uh, dinosaur line creatures. These are called dinosauromorphs. And so this is a time period when dinosaurs weren't quite dominant on the scene. And if you wanna find dinosaurs and their, their close relatives from this time period, you have to go someplace called the Eagle Basin. So this is over near Eagle, Colorado, uh, just west of Vail. And the Eagle Basin preserves some really great fossils that are being studied by uh, some of the former scientists here at the museum and uh, some of our research associates. And they've made some really important discoveries in Colorado because it's so different from the Triassic that you see elsewhere because it's up in those uh, remnants of the ancestral Rocky Mountains. That includes these dinosauromorph uh, animals. So they're not true dinosaurs, but they're very close to the very first dinosaurs. They're called silosaurids. These armored crocodile line herbivores called aetosaurs and even some of the first uh, crown or modern groups of amphibians. This is a very early uh, Sicilian type uh, amphibian. And these are some of my favorite Triassic fossils uh, here at the Denver Museum. So one of those is a aetosaur that you saw in the, the last picture called Stenomite. So that's the armored herbivore. It's got a funny little pig-like nose, long skinny snout. And then this one was named just a couple years ago by uh, one of our former research associates, Jeff Martz, who's at the University of Houston. This is called Quanasaurus. And this is one of the first uh, dinosaur line uh, creatures ever found in Colorado. So this is one of the ancestors of all dinosaurs, including birds. And the parts that were recovered include uh, most of the hips, the legs, the shoulder girdles, the arms, and then these parts of the snout. So the lower jaw and the upper jaw. Really cool animal. Um, it, 
I think deserves a lot more attention like Stegosaurus. It's, a, it's the, the deep, deep ancestor of things like Allosaurus and Stegosaurus. And when we talk about Allosaurus and Stegosaurus, we have to jump all the way to the Jurassic. And here in Colorado, we have to go to the end of the Jurassic in what we call the Morrison Formation. So this is the very end about 150 to 145 million years ago, the very end of the Jurassic there at the top of your screen. And this is what the world looked like at this time. So 150 million years ago, if you were here in Colorado, uh, you would be in the middle of what looks like a pretty uh, similar North American continent. The only difference is that it smashed up against the islands of Europe and then Asia is still hanging out here to the east, but we haven't yet added India. India is still stuck in the south uh, in the continents that we call Gondwana. And those continents are just beginning to break apart. And North America has just separated from Africa and South America, creating the early part of the Atlantic Ocean. If we zoom in on North America itself, you can see here's Colorado and it's sitting down with the last remnants of those ancestral Rocky Mountains and big, big stream systems flowing north into an in, a continental seaway. So this is a really important time period for dinosaur evolution because we've uh, moved away from that very hot, dry Pangean supercontinent and we're starting to get more lush uh, ecosystems showing up in North America. And here in Colorado, we have several really great places. I've circled six, but there's many more than just these six places to go if you're really interested in Jurassic dinosaurs. And that includes the very first place that Jurassic dinosaurs were ever found in uh, North America, and that's Morrison. So just west of Denver in the town of Morrison, it's the first place that these dinosaurs appeared. And this is what the town of Morrison looks like today. And I really love this picture because it shows us pretty much the entire, uh, the entirety of dinosaur time in one frame. And so I'm gonna put our trusty little time scale back here at the top. And if we look from left to right, there is an exposure of red rock. So this red ridge that preserves what we call the, the Permo-Triassic mass extinction. This was the largest max, mass extinction in earth history, knocking out some 90 to 95% of life on earth. And so this little outcrop next to this liquor store in the town of Morrison has the biggest extinction event in the history of the Earth Preserve. So dinosaurs begin right after that extinction event. The slope just to the side of the town of Morrison is what we call the Morrison Formation. This is from the Jurassic. And this is um, a great example of how we name these rock units. Usually we choose uh, an exemplar section, so a, a chunk of rock that we measure very carefully and it's often named after the, one of the closest towns or municipalities. And in this case, the town of Morrison was the closest town to that very first described chunk of rock. If you look at the top of the ridge, there's a really hard sandstone and that represents a beach system that we'll talk about in a minute from the, the Cretaceous, the middle of the Cretaceous. And then way back in the distance, you see that hill, that's Green Mountain. And Green Mountain preserves some of the last dinosaurs and was the source of major discoveries of dinosaurs from Sioux's time. Um, and also preserves the KPG mass extinction, which ended the time of the dinosaurs. So this picture shows the extinction that started the time of the dinosaurs on the left and the extinction that ended the time of the dinosaurs on the right. So all of that is captured along that first hogback here on the front range. So every time you drive out there now, you'll have to think about entering the time of dinosaurs. And Morrison dinosaurs kicked off uh, largely because of this man, Arthur Lakes, who was a part-time professor at uh, the University in Golden, which later became the Colorado School of Mines. He was also a preacher. He did lots of different jobs, but I think the best thing he was was a paleontologist. And so he was really skilled at going out and looking for bones. He knew how to find them. He knew who to get them to, the right people. And in 1877, so just one year after Colorado, became an official state, uh, Arthur Lakes noticed these gigantic bones along the hogback west of Golden down toward the, the town of Morrison. And uh, this reprodu reproduction on the right from a scientific American piece in 1878 shows uh, Arthur Lakes with those discoveries, those huge bones laying out on the surface. 
And what Arthur Lakes did was send those first samples to a man named Othniel Charles March that you see on the left. And that kicked off what we call the bone wars that stretch from that discovery in 1877 until 15 years later in 1892. And that was a big fight between Marsh, who was at the Yale Peabody Museum, and Cope, who was at the, Nas the National Academy in Philadelphia, basically racing to get the biggest, best, coolest, most diverse dinosaurs and other extinct animals out of the ground from the, the American West and ship them back to the East and describe them as fast as they could. And they did an amazing job of that. And that includes here in the, the Morrison area, the first Apatosaurus, so the big long-necked gigantic dinosaur, the top. And then our, our very own state fossil Stegosaurus that you see at the bottom, which was found uh, on the heels of the original discovery of the Morrison Formation. Colorado's Jurassic, though, is not just limited to Morrison. In fact, I would argue that there are better fossils or more abundant fossils in some of these other localities. That includes Garden Park, which is just north of the town of Canyon City, Colorado. And in Garden Park, there are some of the most amazing fossils that have ever come out of, of the Jurassic. Uh, many of these fill the giant museum halls of the East, places like the Smithsonian, uh, the Yale Peabody Museum, uh, all have dinosaurs that were dug out of Garden Park. And so this is a view uh, of a really special part of Garden Park where a man named Marshall Felch, working with March, Marsh, found some really amazing dinosaurs and over the next 11 years excavated nearly complete articulated skeletons of eight major dinosaurs. That includes some of the first evidence of Brachiosaurus, Diplodocus, uh, the first Stegosaurus of several species, and some of the firsts of the meat-eating dinosaurs, things like Allosaurus and Ceratosaurus. So these are big, iconic meat-eating dinosaurs of the Jurassic, uh, kind of the T-Rex of its age. And here at, the DM, at DMNS, we got in on the action as well. So back in the 1920s, uh, crews went down to the Garden Park area and collected uh, several dinosaurs, including this. This was a Stegosaurus. Uh, you can see this man working on the top of a femur, so getting it ready to pull out of the ground and transport up to DMNS. And that turns out to be our very own Stegosaurus that's on display in our prehistoric journey exhibit. So this was part of that big first push into the Jurassic, uh, including time up into the 1920s. But that other dinosaur in the scene, this Allosaurus that's attacking the Stegosaurus, didn't come from the same part of Colorado. This particular dinosaur came from northwestern Colorado near the town of Dinosaur. And that's because this Morrison formation is widespread across the American West. And so even though these dinosaurs were on different points in the state, we know they lived at the same time. So we're able to put these together in our exhibit halls. And if you've ever been to Dinosaur, this is what you think of. Just on the Utah side of the border, you have this amazing quarry wall with these beautiful, gigantic sauropod bones uh, Allosaurus bones, Stegosaurus bones, all in one single wall. And many of these bones were already excavated and sent out to the Eastern Museums uh, before they stopped excavations. Uh, but if you've never been there and you're a dino dinosaur enthusiast, this is the place to go, especially during COVID lockdowns. So get out there and check out some of the cool dinosaurs that are in our own uh, backyard right on the state border with Utah. Our big Diplodocus that's mounted in Prehistoric Journey also came from this wall. So this is one of those early dinosaurs that was excavated uh, from Dinosaur National Monument. And even on the Colorado side, we're still making discoveries. And one of those was made in the early 1990s and has been sitting in our cabinets. And after looking at this particular dinosaur from the Jurassic and spending some time with it, I'm pretty convinced now that it's probably a new type of meat-eating dinosaur from the Jurassic. And so it's closely related to a dinosaur that we know as Marshosaurus of course named after Marsh, uh, but it's, it has several uh, very notable differences. So it probably represents a completely new uh, type of meat-eating dinosaur from right here in Colorado. So this is a brand new uh, dinosaur that uh, we'll be unveiling hopefully in the next couple of years. But since this is a talk about Sioux and Tyrannosaurs, I have to show you another uh, really cool Morrison aged dinosaur. This one's not from Colorado but it is a Tyrannosaur. So during the Morrison time, the very end of the Jurassic, Tyrannosaurs were just getting their, 
their toehold across the Northern Hemisphere. So in places like uh, East Asia and China, there are really amazing discoveries of uh, feathered tyrannosaurs, uh, crested tyrannosaurs. And here in the Rocky Mountains, we've known of at least one type of early tyrannosaur. They're very small. In fact, I've got a cast of this one in front of me. So there it is, I'll hold it out to you. So this is the upper jaw and lower jaw of a brand new type of tyrannosaur, so an ancestor of T-Rex that lived right here in the Rocky Mountain West. But that means we have to jump into the Cretaceous. So Colorado's Cretaceous is a very different beast. So if you think about geologic time, uh, T-Rex is closer to us than T-Rex was to things like this new tyrannosaur and stegosaurus. That's how long dinosaurs were around. And to really understand Colorado's Cretaceous, we're gonna focus on these three little circles on the right. We're gonna leave this one for another talk another day. And to understand what was going on in the Cretaceous of Colorado, we have to look at, again, a global view, or at least a continental view. So at 115 million years ago, the Western Interior Seaway, this big continental seaway was pushing in from the North, from the Arctic. And as it moved across Colorado, it pushed across and left this amazing record of beach or coastal sediments. And so this particular coastline swept its way across Colorado over several million years, leaving behind a really amazing record. And that's preserved in two particularly uh, interesting spots here in Colorado. It's Dinosaur Ridge. So if you've ever been over uh, west of Denver to Dinosaur Ridge, you've probably seen some amazing dinosaur tracks. And the other place is called the Garden of the Gods, which is down near Colorado Springs. And both of these are important because they give us a glimpse of not only dinosaur tracks, but also a potential track maker. And so this is what Dinosaur Ridge looks like. There's an amazing small museum at the bottom of the hill. And then you get to go up and check out some of these coastal dinosaur trackways preserved right on the side of the mountain. So this is that a big rocky unit that we talked about when we looked at the town of Morrison. So this is full of footprints of meat-eating dinosaurs. These really narrow toed tracks are from what we call theropods or the meat eaters. And these big bulb toed tracks are three toed tracks of what we call iguanodont dinosaurs. So these are two legged plant eaters. And this is what those two legged plant eaters look like. They're walking back here in the far distance uh, along this ancient seaway. So there's a seaway to the east and you see these tracks moving up and down the beach. And that's what Dinosaur Ridge was. And this trackway extends all the way from southeastern Colorado up through the town of Fort Collins and even north into Wyoming. So this is what we call the Dinosaur Superhighway. Anytime you get these beach rocks from this time period between about 90 million years ago and about 120 million years ago, you're bound to find dinosaur tracks. And they can be exquisitely preserved, including uh, skin impressions and claw impressions on the ends of them. Uh, really great uh, uh, tracks to see. And if you have time, get over to Dinosaur Ridge. It's really cool. Great place to spend some time when it's nice and warm. And what's really unusual with dinosaur trackways is that you often don't know who the track maker was because bones are preserved in different sediments than tracks. And so we can't always be sure of who made what type of track. But if we go down south to Colorado Springs, we end up in the Garden of the Gods uh, Park. And so this is Garden of the Gods. These are amazing Paleozoic uh, sandstones and conglomerates sticking up out of the ground, much older than the time of the dinosaurs. But back in the late 1800s, uh, this particular skull was found and sent back east to Marsh. And he thought it was from the Morrison Formation. So he thought this was a Jurassic dinosaur. And that's where it sat for 90 years in the collections uh, as just another type of Jurassic dinosaur. But my predecessor uh, went back, restudied the specimen and realized that it actually represented a Cretaceous dinosaur, uh, most likely an Iguanodontian, so that three-toed bulbous-toed track maker uh, and he named it Theophytalia. Uh, Theophytalia means uh, the garden of deities. So it's named after garden of the gods. And so this is probably very close, if not the track maker that made those same dinosaur tracks all across the front range of Colorado from Dinosaur Ridge. It's a really cool story of going back and using collections 
to revise uh, what we know about dinosaur evolution. By about 90 million years ago, that big Western interior seaway that remember was pushing its way south, eventually joins up with the Caribbean and splits North America in half. And as you see Colorado here, again in the center, we're completely underwater. And this is a time period where you don't find dinosaur fossils. This is when you find things like gigantic fishes, you find things like marine reptiles. Uh, the only birds that are common in this, or sorry, the only dinosaurs that are common in this time period are birds. And so some of the marine birds are known from Colorado and places like Kansas from this Western Interior Seaway. And here at DMNS, we have several great examples from this time period, and that includes our gigantic plesiosaur, Thalassimodon, which when you first enter the north atrium of the museum, you see swimming through the air above you, chasing fish. So this is from that time period where we don't have a good example of Sue's friends, uh, at least Sue's land living friends here in the Rocky Mountains. But we do have uh, some of the marine reptiles that thrived in the oceans at the same time that dinosaurs ruled the land. But to really talk about Sue's world and Sue's actual friends, we need to jump all the way to the very end of the Cretaceous. And so we've spent the first 15 minutes of this talk talking about other dinosaurs from Colorado and from the Front Range. But for the next part of this talk, I really wanna focus in on the history of dinosaurs from the very end of the Cretaceous. So this is a time period that's between about 69 and 66 million years ago. So the last 3 million years, that dinosaurs ruled North America. And that includes things like T-Rex, of course, so Sue and Sue's cousins, but also other animals. And if we look at what Colorado was at 66 million years ago, uh, it looks very familiar. So you see the beginnings of our Rocky Mountains, so the modern Rocky Mountains poking up across Colorado. And Sue itself is from uh, parts of South Dakota. And this area is known for um, many different types of dinosaurs. This is the Hell Creek formation of the Dakotas into Montana, and then what we call the Lance or the Lance Creek formation down into Wyoming. So this is what we consider to be Sioux's true world. This is uh, the hotbed of activity for T-Rex, Triceratops, and all of the other small dinosaurs that lived in this realm. And if you're interested in finding T-Rex and dinosaurs that lived alongside T-Rex, you'd wanna to go to places like what's marked here with stars. So we talked about this Northern cluster. So places like the Lance of Eastern Wyoming, the Hell Creek formation of Montana and the Dakotas, but there are also amazing T-Rex and other dinosaur fossils from places like central Utah, across New Mexico, and even down into the Big Bend region of Texas. So if you're a T-Rex enthusiast, you have lots of places that you can go to look for uh, T-Rex fossils. And one of those happens to be right here along the Front Range. So again, this is a time period when things like T-Rex ruled, but there were lots and lots of other dinosaurs on the scene. So not only were there um, big horned dinosaurs like Triceratops and Taurosaurus, there were armored dinosaurs like Denversaurus, which we're gonna visit here in a minute, and also things like raptors and dome-headed pachycephalosaurids that we talked about at the beginning. And by far one of the most common was this duckbill dinosaur called Edmontosaurus. Edmontosaurus was one of the largest duckbills to have ever evolved. Uh, it had a very long, low snout, very powerful hind limb, so it could probably walk uh, bipedally if it needed to. But it was so large, the size of a big elephant, it probably came down to the ground. And it was probably one of the favorite foods of Sioux. So if you've been to the exhibit, you've probably seen this huge sculpture of a uh, life-size sculpture, life-sized sculpture of Sue uh, chomping down on an Edmontosaurus. And we have one of the best uh, records of Edmontosaurus preserved uh, here at the museum in the form of a huge bone bed from Eastern Wyoming that was donated to the museum about three years ago by the Hankla family, uh, who had been digging out in Eastern Wyoming for uh, decades, collecting these huge bone beds full of duckbill dinosaur leg bones. These are legs, upper jaws, uh, there's crocodile teeth mixed in, T-Rex teeth mixed in, but this is really an Edmontosaurus bone bed. And we have one of the best uh, records of a single group of Edmontosaurus anywhere in the world. And like I mentioned, there's another cool dinosaur from this time period, Denversaurus. 
So the armored dinosaurs were still on the scene that included Ankylosaurus, which had a big tail club. And then there were the Notosaurus that didn't have the tail club, but had large shoulder spikes and really long sloping flattened heads. And one of those was discovered in the 1920s in South Dakota, that's this particular skull. And it was uh, reposited here at the Denver Museum. It sat in our collections for several decades before scientists realized that this was likely a very different type of notosaurid ankylosaur. And so they named it after the Denver Museum. So even though it's called Denversaurus, it wasn't actually found here in Denver. Uh, it's just named for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science. So if you go to the exhibit or if you've been to the exhibit, you'll see this skull, which is one of a kind. Uh, there are several skulls known, but this is the only complete skull in any major museum in the world. And so you'll get a chance to see that up close. And what's really cool about Denversaurus is that uh, we do find evidence that Denversaurus lived in the Denver area. So there are chunks of its armor, there are pieces of uh, its skull, and there are even isolated teeth from around the Denver metro area. So we know that Denversaurus uh, was here in the Denver area, even though the main skull was discovered in South Dakota. One of the other dinosaurs you'll see if you come to the exhibit is this dome-headed dinosaur. This is a rare one called Sparatholus. So this what basically looks like a big melon or softball. Uh, that was the top of the head of a dome-headed dinosaur. This was collected by our curator of of vertebrate paleontology, Tyler Leeson, several years ago. And this is, happens to be the largest and one of the most complete skulls of this type of dinosaur ever discovered. And so we have that on display right now. And we even worked with our, our favorite paleo artist, Andrea Tuchin, to reconstruct what Sparatholus would have looked like. So here you can see a pair of Sparatholus munching on some ferns and early uh, gingers in the forests of uh, the Denver metro area. This is another dinosaur you'll see if you come to the exhibit. This is called Anzu Wileyi. And Anzu was about five feet tall at the hip. And so even though it looks like a bird, it's actually the size of a, a pretty good sized dinosaur, even bigger than an ostrich. And Anzu was one of those fierce, um, crested, uh, relatively toothless types of dinosaurs that we call oviraptorosaurs. And so this is a huge oviraptorosaur. Uh, known from across the Hell Creek Formation in the north and even down into the Denver area where we do find things like claws and other limb bones of Anzu. And then of course, if you come to the exhibit, you'll see Triceratops. And this is a big part of uh, Sue's local friends as we're gonna see. Triceratops and horned dinosaurs are really the cows of this time period. They're very common. And because their skulls are so big and so robust, they're so heavy duty, uh, they preserve really well in the fossil record. So we have a really nice uh, example of several different types of horned dinosaur uh, from Sioux's world right here in the Denver metro area. And so even though this exhibit is focused on Sioux and that amazing brand of the largest and oldest individual T-Rex that's ever been found, I wanna spend the rest of this evening talking about our own superstars. And that includes Tiny the Taurosaurus and some of Sue's local friends. And so I'm gonna argue that Sue is great, but we have some cooler dinosaurs from here in the Denver uh, metro area all the way along the front range. So let's come back to this picture. So this is a reconstruction of what uh, South Denver would have looked like 66 million years ago. Uh, this is an area that we call the Denver Basin. So the Denver Basin extends from right around Greeley down to Colorado Springs. And Denver sits right in the middle of this amazing rock basin. This is what the rock units look like. So this is a geologic map of the Denver basin. And you think about a geologic map as kind of like an onion and you're looking at the different layers of this onion. And so these uh, green layers on the outside are marine shales when the entire state of Colorado is covered with the seaway. Then the yellow is the first coastal sediment. So these are the first dinosaur bearing rocks in this onion. And as we move toward the center, we're getting younger and younger. The orange are big conglomerates coming off the very first big pulse of Rocky Mountain uplift. And then these brown rocks are uh, equivalent to the Hell Creek formation. These are, these are the rocks that include things like T-Rex and Triceratops. And what's really interesting here in the Denver area is that they're split by this pink line. 
And so this pink line is a uh, representation of what we call the KPG boundary or the KT uh, extinction event. And that's when dinosaurs go extinct. And that means that anything on the outside of this line includes rocks that have dinosaurs and anything on the inside of this line uh, is after dinosaurs go extinct. So everything on the uh, major footprint of Denver all the way up east and then wrapping all the way out into the plains and back toward Colorado Springs on the outside of that line has the potential for dinosaurs. So this is what Denver looks like. So we're coming back to this map as I promised uh, with that red line drawn over, uh, over the area. So you can see much of Littleton, Lakewood, Arvada, Thornton, all the way up to Boulder are in dinosaur country. They're on the good side of the KPG line. On the other side, you have ex the extinction of the dinosaurs and the recovery of life on earth. So things like mammals and some of the plants that took over uh, Colorado and, and North America after dinosaurs went extinct. And one of the best places to go to see the, the actual KPG boundary, the actual KT boundary is a place called West Bijou Creek out in the plains. And this is what the KPG boundary looks like. Uh, as you see, there's big alternating layers of black rock and whitish tan rock. And the black is a, a coal. So these are representative of, of, of swamps. And then these uh, silty layers are tan. So these are um, silts and muds that are moving in through this uh, area in rivers and other uh, slow moving streams. But the KPG boundary is this darkish, a uh, gray layer. And this happens to be the best place anywhere on earth to stick your finger right on that point when an asteroid hit North America and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs or at least the non-bird dinosaurs. So everything below this line has potential for producing dinosaur fossils. Everything above this line uh, is after the time of dinosaurs. And so we have the best place on earth to put your finger on that line right here east of Denver. So to explore Denver's dinosaurs, or Sue's friends as I call them, we have to go way, way back in time to about the same time that Arthur Lakes was digging up Morrison dinosaurs from the Jurassic of Colorado. Uh, Arthur Lake and Lakes and his friends were also digging up uh, dinosaurs from the Cretaceous. Uh, so again, this is a time period when uh, Colorado is just becoming a state. And this was a really interesting time for finding fossils because nearly all of the trees had been removed from the Denver area. So uh, most of our, the buildings of this time were made of wood. Um, and so uh, early settlers to Denver basically denuded the landscape and that caused a lot of erosion. That means a lot of these dinosaurs were just starting to wash out because the trees had been removed. And that includes, believe it or not, the very first T-Rex tooth that was ever recognized. And so in 1874, that's about 30 years before T-Rex was even recognized as a distinct dinosaur. The very first evidence of T-Rex was uncovered over near um, South Table Mountain. This is the very first evidence of T-Rex. This is a tooth that's currently in the Yale Peabody Museum out east. Uh, and that was discovered again by Arthur Lakes and uh, one of his colleagues, Edward Berthoud. And so they were out looking for dinosaurs in the Cretaceous just as much as they were in the Jurassic. The very first Triceratops also comes from Denver. In fact, this is from very close to downtown, uh, just across the river from Confluence Park. So this is what we now call the Highland neighborhood of Denver. Uh, so this very first Triceratops was the, the trendiest of dinosaurs. And that consisted of what we call a bison alticornis. So it was first discovered, this thing is starting to move on me here. There we go. So bison alticornis was, um, <laughs> doesn't want us to see it. Uh, the very first triceratops was uh, the top of the head, the horns of uh, triceratops. And because we didn't know what a horned dinosaur was yet in 1887, it was described as a bison. And so the very first triceratops was actually called bison alticornis. So it's a type of tall horned bison. Uh, later we re revised that, we recognized that uh, this represented a horned dinosaur, very distinct uh, from uh, bison, obviously. The very first Ornithomimus was found here in the Denver metro area down near Bear Creek 
And you might be saying to yourself, what in the world is an ornithomimus? And this is a really cool story. So the ornithomimus bones that were found include a foot. So these three bones in the lower left are bones in the foot called the metatarsals. The ankle, so this is the bottom of the shin bone with the ankle bone attached to it. Several of the toes and then even parts of the hand. But what's most interesting is that um, this was recognized to be very similar to an ostrich, even at the, the very beginning, right when it was discovered. So this bone that is being compared to uh, by Marsh is the leg bone of an ostrich. And uh, what's amazing is that we consider these, uh, even call these today ostrich mimic dinosaurs because they're so similar to ostriches. And I've just completely blown away that Marsh was able to make that comparison uh, so early with the very first bits of bone. The middle years, so extending from about 1950 to 2000, so the latter half of the 20th century, uh, witnessed a ton of growth in Colorado. And so even though the trees were coming back, uh, we were starting to dig in and create big skyscrapers and put in big uh, buildings. And whenever you dig down in Denver, you, know, you have the potential to find dinosaurs. That includes uh, what we call the Leyden Ceratopsian, which is this really amazing horned dinosaur discovery from northwest of Denver. Uh, we don't know for sure what it is. Uh, this is a lower jaw, and if you visit the exhibit, you'll see this on display for the, for the very first time since it was discovered in 1975. Uh, we just have the jaw, so this is the lower jaw, and then parts of the arm, the hips, and some of the ribs. So we don't know for sure what type of dinosaur this is, although my predecessor Ken Carpenter speculated that this was a Taurosaurus. So this may be the very first example of a Taurosaurus found in the Denver Basin. We also have the discovery of what's called the Littleton T-Rex during this period. And so this is a really cool discovery down southwest of Denver. And this is what we, when we say that you can literally find dinosaurs in your backyard, that is exactly what this was. So this was a housing development project uh, at the time in 1992. And you can see this house is being built and out in the backyard uh, is a group of our volunteers and staff digging up a T-Rex skeleton. And it wasn't a particularly complete skeleton. It was much of the, the hind limb, parts of the hips, uh, a complete shoulder blade, some ribs, and even a couple of teeth. And what's really interesting is that those teeth are fully rooted. And you typically don't find fully rooted T-Rex teeth unless they've fallen out of a complete skull. So I suspect that this backyard, which no one has touched since 1992, still has a complete T-Rex skull uh, somewhere just under the surface. You can tell that it's just at the very interface with uh, where you would put your sod and your, your trees uh, in your backyard. So someday we're going to have to volunteer to go put in a swimming pool for this particular house so we can look for the rest of that uh, T-Rex skull. And of course, this was a time period when we found our Coors Field dinosaur. So all of you know your Coors Field dinosaur as Dinger now. Uh, the bones that were discovered during construction of Coors Field in 1993 were pretty scrappy. It was uh, chunks of ribs uh, and a couple other little chunks of bone. We don't know whether it was a duck-billed dinosaur like Edmontosaurus or a horned dinosaur like Triceratops, but the Rockies decided to go with a Triceratops because they look uh, pretty cool. In 1995, Triceratops, were track Triceratops tracks were found uh, just south of Golden in a place that uh, we now call uh, the Triceratops Trail. So if you've ever been to Golden, I recommend uh, getting out there to check out these dinosaur tracks. They represent probably Triceratops or Taurosaurus horned dinosaur footprints. And the golf course right behind the Triceratops Trail took on the name of this discovery. It's now known as Fossil Trace Golf Course. Uh, so it's a really cool example of one of those mid 90s discoveries of dinosaurs here in the Front Range. And then of course, we have the later years. So from about 2000 to today, so the last 21 years of dinosaur research. And I think uh, based on the growth of Denver, uh, this is just gonna continue in, uh, into the future. So dinosaurs are gonna continue coming out of the ground from the Denver metro area, from the suburbs of Denver, because we sit on some of the best dinosaur country in the world. That includes a discovery uh, in 2003 that we called the Brighton Triceratops. That was found when a bulldozer operator noticed that he had just crashed through uh, a nearly complete skull of a Triceratops. 
So there you see uh, the skull uh, fully restored. It's currently on display in prehistoric journey at the museum, so our permanent exhibit. The Thornton Taurosaurus, so in 2017, another excavation project uh, was underway when uh, a geotech noticed a couple of fragments of bone on the surface and was really, really uh, smart to call in um, some experts. And so they called an uh, expert named uh, Paul Murphy with Rocky Mountain Paleo Solutions. And uh, Paul Murphy then called, called the museum. And I went out there the next day and realized that this was most of a horn and part of a shoulder blade. And after two weeks of digging, we were able to recover what's now the most complete skull of a horned dinosaur from Colorado. And what's even more fascinating is that this is the most complete skull of a very rare type of horned dinosaur called Taurosaurus. So here's all of the skull parts laid out on a table. Uh, this is the, the frill, the shield behind the head. These are the horns over the eyes. This is the nose with the little nose horn. And then this is the beak at the front of the snout. So this is a nearly complete skull of Taurosaurus. And all the parts that we collected are indicated here in orange. So here you can see the recovered portions of our Taurosaurus. And we've been very lucky to have great partners. This is a, a lab out in Fruta, Colorado, where um, one of our partners, Rob Gaston, is one of the best at putting dinosaurs back together. And he just delivered right before Sue opened a couple of months ago, the complete skull and skeleton of Tiny the Taurosaurus. So if you haven't been to the museum, you should come and check out the Thornton Taurosaurus uh, on display for the very first time, our local celebrity. And what's really nice about having a nearly complete Taurosaurus is that we can address an outstanding hypothesis in paleontology. And that hypothesis has to do with the difference between Taurosaurus and Triceratops. So there, you said, there you can see a, a Taurosaurus at the top of your screen and a Triceratops at the bottom. Uh, the main difference that we recognize is that Taurosaurus has this open um, window through the bone of the frill called a fenestra. It wouldn't have been open completely in, in life. It would have been covered with soft tissue and skin. So you wouldn't have noticed uh, on a living Taurosaurus that it had this window. But in the fossil, it's a very distinct feature. And one of the hypotheses that was presented about 11 years ago was that Taurosaurus uh, represents the adult form of a Triceratops. So here you see a growth sequence of Triceratops from a little baby uh, indicated up in the upper left at A to a fairly large adult at E. And that continues to an even larger adult Triceratops in this figure, and then culminating with uh, a change in the frill to open windows uh, with Taurosaurus representing the oldest adult stage of a Triceratops. Now, what led scientists to speculate that Taurosaurus was an adult Triceratops was partly the fact that most Taurosaurus specimens are gigantic. They're really huge. Uh, they're much bigger than many Triceratops skulls. And so that alone, uh, the fact that most of our Taurosaurus specimens were very old adults uh, was very reasonable to then hypothesize that maybe this was the adult form of a Triceratops. In order to test that though, we need to do more work on Taurosaurus. And we're really lucky because not only did we get a complete skull, but we've got major parts of the post cranium, So the uh, ribs, the, the leg bones uh, of tiny the Taurosaurus. And so just last Friday, so just uh, last week, we went down into the workshop of the museum in the exhibits area, and we were able to use their big old drill press, and we actually punched out several holes from the limb bones of Tiny the Taurosaurus. So here you can see one of our postdocs, Holger Peterman, uh, drilling into the tibia or shin bone of Tiny the Taurosaurus. And then there you can see the plug that we pulled out of that hole from the arm bone, the humerus of Tiny. And so using the information in these plugs, we can then look at the growth of Tiny. And we can speculate that um, Tiny might be able to tell us a little bit more about this hypothesis of Taurosaurus Triceratops relationships. So here's a speculative growth curve. So imagine that each of these blue green dots represents a different age stage of Triceratops like we saw with the skulls. And if Tiny ends up plotting out at the very end of this growth curve, then we can say that uh, with pretty good confidence that that hypothesis uh, was potentially uh, supported by our research. If Tiny's bone, in fact, pops out in the middle, though, 
then we have evidence that perhaps uh, dinosaurs like tiny are distinct. So Taurosaurus is a distinct species. And so that's something that we're uh, just now starting to dig into. And hopefully uh, we can do another talk here in another six to 12 months and dig into whether or not tiny is a Taurosaurus or an adult Triceratops. So the jury is still out. You have to be patient. Dinosaurs take a long time to study because they're so big. Uh, tiny took over a year just to clean. waiting for this next slide to load here. <laughs> so what you saw there was a reconstruction of Tiny. Um, this is the first full painting of what Tiny the Taurosaurus would have looked like. Uh, we zipped right by it though. Maybe it'll reload for us. There it is. Uh, and we reconstructed it with some of the other dinosaurs that you've been introduced to. And that includes Spherotholus, the dome-headed dinosaur, and also some of these really cool tortoise-like turtles called basilemmies, which we do find here in the Denver area. So again, I wanna emphasize that we're not just looking at dinosaurs, we're looking at all the information, plants, uh, birds, lizards, snakes, um, fishes, everything that can give us information about the past. One of our most recent big discoveries was two years ago in 2019 in Highlands Ranch where uh, yeah, another construction project, this, is, this time for an assisted living facility uh, just near Chatfield Reservoir, uncovered the bones of a Triceratops. And so our crews of volunteers and students and uh, lab technicians and scientists all headed down to Highlands Ranch and spent about two months at what turned out to be a really muddy, sloppy site uh, because the uh, next door golf course continued watering their, their lawns, which seeped through the site the entire time. Uh, we were able to collect major portions of uh, adult triceratops skeleton that you see here being dragged away. The jacket on the right is an upper arm bone or humerus. There's a vertebra in the jacket. So these are just coming out of the jackets. And I just received some of these pictures from uh, our preparator uh, last week. So these are fresh, uh, pictures of the state of the Highlands Ranch Triceratops. So the big blob you see on the left is actually the skull. That's where the eye would have been. And these two stumps at the top are where the big horns over the eyes would have sat. So those are broken away. The thing in the upper right is the beak of the lower jaw. And this is a nice preserved left lower jaw. And I included a picture of the really beautiful teeth of the lower jaw. It's just an exquisite specimen. And it turns out that this is probably the most complete horned dinosaur uh, ever discovered in Colorado. And so we have now have most of the skull. And as we've prepped these blocks, we now recognize that we have most of the rest of the body. So we have much of, of the postcranial skeleton, including the complete hips, the arm and leg bones, and many of the vertebrae or uh, portions of the spine down the back. And what's really exciting is that this site preserved many different aspects of the ecosystem. So it wasn't just a single Triceratops. It also preserved portions of several Edmontosaurus, so those duck-billed dinosaurs that you see in the back, uh, along with other evidence of ancient Colorado or ancient Highlands Ranch. Uh, and this is a reconstruction hot off the press from uh, our partner, Andrea Tuchin, where you can see the early Rocky Mountains rising from uh, ancient Chatfield Reservoir, ancient Highlands Ranch. Uh, and then this discovery just came across our desk a couple of weeks ago. You may have seen it in the news. This is a Boulder County T-Rex uh, just outside of Broomfield, Colorado. And this was brought in by an eighth grader named Jonathan uh, Charpentier. Um, and he brought in this amazing T-Rex tooth that he stumbled across uh, while walking in some uh, public space. And so this T-Rex tooth is um, by far the most recent major discovery. March 2021, really two weeks old, of a, a T-Rex tooth from right here in the Denver metro area. And this is an area that we've known has produced bone. Uh, we've been working with the county officials for the last two years uh, to go back and preserve some of these fossils. And so we hope to go back out with Jonathan later this summer uh, to look for more bones um, and hopefully make some other major discoveries of dinosaurs right in our own backyard. I just wanna end with one last dinosaur discovery this one comes from Northern Colorado. Uh, so most of our horned dinosaurs, the, the Thornton Taurosaurus, Highlands Ranch, are down in the Denver metro area. 
But up in northern Colorado in Weld County, in fact, up in northern Weld County, uh, a dinosaur was discovered in 1982 that was thought to be a triceratops. So for the last 35 years, uh, this triceratops skull has sat in the Weld County buildings on display, um, so fully publicly accessible. Um, and it was a really beautiful skull. And so a couple of years ago, I approached the county because uh, it turns out that this skull is pretty unique uh, in all of the world. And I'll talk to you about that in a second. So this is uh, what the skull looks like. We were able to bring it down from Weld County this, uh, this winter. We've had it down in our prep labs and our amazing prep team uh, has been able to clean the skull. So our chief preparator, Natalie Toth, and our assistant preparator, Salvador Bastion, have cleaned the skull uh, exquisitely. So if you look at this old picture, there's really nasty old plaster and Bondo smeared all over it. Uh, it's in a big metal frame that was bolted into the skull. And so they fully restored the specimen and it's revealed some really interesting features on the skull. Uh, this is our paleo artist uh, wizard, Andrea Tuchin again. So he's in the process of reconstructing the Weld Triceratops nicknamed Pops. Um, so this is what Pops is starting to look like on the right has a really weird dish shaped frill. And what's really interesting is that Pops actually comes from a much older rock unit. So most of the fossils in Colorado or the Denver metro area come from what we call the Denver formation at the top. Uh, the Laramie formation is quite a bit older. It's between 68 and 70 million years old. And we think that Pops, the skull from Weld County came from the bottom of the Laramie. So somewhere closer to 69 million years. And if we look across North America, the only other dinosaur from this time period is one called Eo Triceratops. And there are several features on the skull that we, uh, that we cleaned from Weld County that look a lot like an Eo Triceratops. That includes what we call the triangular process of the premaxilla. So this weird triangle, if you look on pops and go back, see how it's a big fin? Typically in a Triceratops, it would be just a single little spine or little process. So that's a really unique feature that tells us that Pops might actually be a different type of horned dinosaur, possibly an Eo Triceratops, and the first ever found in the United States. And then finally, I wanna end with one of our other big discoveries. This was led by uh, two of our other curators, Tyler Leeson and Ian Miller here at DMNS. Uh, and they've been working down just east of Colorado Springs in a place called Corral Bluffs. And you've probably heard about this discovery, but this comes from the inside of that pink line. And this is the recovery of, of fossils after dinosaurs go extinct. So this is a great example of what our own lineage, mammals, uh, was able to do after dinosaurs were cleared away from the scene. So these are some of the amazing skulls from their discovery. So I've hit my time and I don't wanna take any more because I'm hoping that you have lots of great questions. Uh, all of the work that I've described has uh, been contributed to by many, many different scientists. Uh, also, many of our great volunteers have been involved. And also we've been supported by many local agencies, including the state of Colorado and the Bureau of Land Management uh, and the city of Denver, the city of Colorado Springs. Everybody has been pitching in to help us uncover Sue and Sue's friends uh, from here in the Denver metro area. So with that, I'm gonna end and I would love to get some of your questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Sertich. That was really incredible. Um, so we are at about time. Are you willing to stay on for just a little bit longer to answer some questions? Absolutely. Awesome, because uh, there have been lots of them, lots of amazing questions. Um, for me personally, I loved hearing not only about the, the geological timeline and how long ago dinosaurs were, but also the timeline of discoveries here in Denver. I kind of could mark the periods of my life with the discovery of dinosaurs, <laughs> which was really neat. Um, so if you do have questions, please, please, please put them in the chat and I will ask them to Dr. Sertich. But to get started, um, Kitty was wondering, what caused the extinction which started the age of the dinosaurs? That is a great question. So what's called the, the Permo-Triassic or the Permian-Triassic mass extinction. So that's the really huge one. Um, there are lots of different possible causes. Remember, this is a time when we had Pangaea. Uh, there were major volcanoes that were just beginning uh, to erupt and spew lots of um, ash and gas into the atmosphere. And there also been hypotheses that um, some gases, so big frozen gases at the bottom of the sea were also upwelling and causing a uh, major disturbance to the atmosphere, to the climate. And so this was a time period of major upheaval in the earth. 
Uh, and so we think that it's most likely related to something internal rather than an extraterrestrial event like an asteroid. So it's probably just growing pains of the earth that caused that big extinction. Earth's growing pains are felt by all. Um, also, would you hold up that skull again? Some folks weren't able to see it when you held it up earlier. The printed of course. Ooh. So that's the upper jaw and I also have the lower jaw of a very early Tyrannosaur. So we are closer in time to T-Rex than T-Rex was to this particular ancestor, which is crazy. Pretty impressive. <laughs> um, why are fossils of sauropods still so seldom found? Yeah, so sauropods are those long-necked, gigantic dinosaurs, which we find lots and lots of because their limb bones are so heavy duty. They're just big, solid, basically tree trunks but their skulls are made up of paper thin bones that were very weakly held to each other and also pretty weakly held to the neck. And so we think that uh, for a dinosaur like a sauropod to be buried, so in order for you to cover those gigantic bones, that body with enough mud and sand, you needed what you call a pretty high energy environment. So lots of fast moving water. But the problem is fast moving water also pulls apart really delicate structures. So we think that in order to preserve or save a sauropod, you also have to sacrifice part of it. And that ends up having to be most of the head. It's fascinating stuff. <laughs> it's really cool. Uh, Danny, who is seven years old, is wondering, how do we know that a particular bone goes with another bone? How do we know that they're from the same dinosaur and that we're not just mixing two dinosaurs together? That is a great question. And that's what I spend most of my day scratching my head over. So a lot of times we find what we call bone beds. So we have a deposition of many different dinosaur skeletons all jumbled together. And so we have to sit down and slowly piece, to, piece together which bones go to which individual. And to do that, we look at the type of dinosaur it was. So if you have a mix of different species, you can separate them that way. And we can also separate them based on size. And so um, often we don't get all of the same size class of dinosaur. We get adults and teenagers all the way down to little babies and that helps us sort them out. But at the end of the day, sometimes we can't tell. Sometimes we have just a bunch of different bones that we can't say for sure goes to a single dinosaur. And in that case, we have to study them separately, individually. And this question is similar. Wayne asked earlier, um, and you addressed this a little bit during your talk. How do you determine if a fossil is a new dinosaur or just a younger or older version of an already discovered dinosaur? And that's a new idea. So that's what we get into for the last uh, 10 or 12 years of what we call ontogomorphs. And so this is this new idea in paleontology that dinosaurs change as they age, which isn't surprising. A lot of us change as we age. Uh, we look very different from what we looked like when we were five years old. Um, and so that is something that scientists, paleontologists are currently going back to the fossil record to investigate, to see if some of these different dinosaur species may represent different growth stages of a single species. Um, and to do that, we need lots of fossils. And so we've got to get back out and continue collecting. And so for a lot of these, it's a big question mark still, and that's something we're working on. And it's a really great question. That's, that's one of the hot topics in paleontology right now. I feel like ontogomorphs is my new favorite word. And also maybe <laughs> a great title for like a young adult book series. Come on, ontogomorphs. ontogomorphs. <laughs> Uh, some folks are wondering, they really want to go out in nature and experience some of these things for themselves. They're wondering where a good exposure of the KT boundary is near Denver. So the very first KT boundary or KPG boundary that was recognized is over on South Table Mountain. So you can't go out and stick your finger directly on it. But back in the late 1800s and early 1900s, it was recognized that dinosaur fossils were present at the base of South Table Mountain, so over near Golden. But as you climbed the hill, at one point, somewhere halfway up the hill, dinosaur fossils just stop showing up. And the only thing that you find are crocodiles and turtles and mammal fossils. And so that was the first spot that was ever recognized to have the KPG or KT boundary, the extinction. So that's a great place to go and see a KT boundary here. And then similarly, uh, folks are wondering if the West Bijou Creek outcrop is open to the public, if they can go there. Unfortunately, it's not. So that beautiful outcrop is on private land. And so even we have to ask for permission to go out and, and check out that cool site. But it's just really neat to know that the best place in the entire world to look at that extinction is right here in our own backyards. 
It is cool. <laughs> Roxanne is wondering if there is a noticeable increase in species diversity across the world as time has progressed and the continents split apart. There is. So the diversity of life on Earth and the diversity of different families or major groups of different animals has slowly been increasing through time. And so that curve is what we use in the past to, to decide what is a normal extinction event or a mass extinction event. And so um, progressing through time from about 550 million years ago, we see a general increase or diversity of different types of plants and animals. And so as the continents break apart, as new forms evolve, uh, we see a continuing uh, increase in the number of families or major groups of animals and plants. Excellent. Um, I don't know if you'll be able to speak to this, but apparently a paper reported that Wyoming gastroliths from the Morrison Formation had stolen from Wisconsin. Is that believable? And can you speak to that? <laughs> yes, I've seen the same thing. Um, so there are polished stones that are found throughout the Morrison Formation. Uh, one idea is that those polished stones were swallowed by dinosaurs to aid in digestion. So they might have been um, something like a gizzard stone or just something in their stomach to help um, perturbate or move around vegetable material. So they're eating tough conifers. And so one idea is that those polished stones were swallowed by dinosaurs um, that were moving across the landscape. And so maybe these uh, rocks that were swallowed in Wisconsin were uh, burped up in Wyoming. Um, another idea is that these are slowly transported across North America. So remember, the North America is a very dynamic place, and so we're constantly moving sediment. So uh, another hypothesis is that these are polished rocks um, that have just moved across North America's landscape. So we don't know for sure whether this is carried in the gut of a dinosaur and just burped up later, or if it was just naturally moved across North America's ancient landscape. Cool. I've never heard of gastroliths before, and that's my new favorite thing. Kind of <laughs> so many new words. <laughs> um, Kevin is wondering, how far down do you have to dig to find a dinosaur? Well, it depends on how strong you are. <laughs> <laughs> to find a dinosaur, though, you need to have some evidence that it exists on the surface. And so as paleontologists, we don't typically go and dig random holes. We look for places where a dinosaur bone or skeleton is eroding out. And so it's typically very close to the surface. Although there are places where we've dug, um, where we've ended up having to move huge mountains basically to get at the rest of the dinosaurs. So a great example of that is Dinosaur National Monument where the first little bits of bone were exposed on a mountaintop and it took several decades, but paleontologists dug their way into the mountain. And that's why there's that beautifully exposed dinosaur bone wall at Dinosaur National Monument because they ended up just following those bones from the top of the mountain down across that wall, down inside the mountain. Um, we have a lot of questions from Kevin who's now wondering, how do you determine one geologic period from another? So the geologic timescale is one of the great feats of, of humanity. So being able to put together and recognize how old the earth is and how these different time periods are dated and how they stack up uh, to each other is one of these great um, um, mysteries that was solved by many, many uh, scientists, paleontologists, uh, geologists over more than a century. And so this is something that's taken um, really the body of paleontologists and geologists to assemble over time. And we're still refining that, we're still constantly redating the geologic time scales or going back and redating those different time periods. Uh, and really it's just based on what we see, several different uh, laws of geology that things at the bottom are older than things at the top. And then looking for different ways to date those rocks. So using crystals, um, using cosmic rays, using all kinds of different ways to date rock. Uh, and we've been able to slowly piece together this really amazing window into geologic time. Pretty amazing feats. Humans are so cool. I mean, dinosaurs are super cool. Humans also really cool. Pretty impressive. Um, Debbie would like to, to mention that uh, the KT boundary is pretty easily seen at Trinidad Lake State Park. That's well marked. So if you're looking for an excursion, Debbie recommends Trinidad Lake State Park. <laughs> you can definitely head south. Yes. So the Raton Basin down near Trinidad also has a great KPG boundary. KPG, apologies. Um, and now, of course, T-Rexes. Uh, how much of Sue do we have? Sue is still one of the most complete T-Rex 
skeletons ever found. So it was discovered in 1990. Uh, it was about 95% complete. It's missing a couple tail bones and a couple toe bones. Um, so a couple of small bits and pieces here and there, but it's largely complete. And we haven't found any other T-Rex skeleton or adult T-Rex skeleton that even comes close to as complete as Sue. So we're really lucky to have Sue. And if you haven't seen Sue at the museum, you should get in and check Sue out. I will put a link in the chat to that. So make sure to check that out. Um, two more questions before we go. Jackie is just hoping for a status update on snow mass. Uh, on snow mass. They acknowledge not a dinosaur, but they're still wondering how snow mass is doing. <laughs> snow mass is doing great. So we still have uh, all the bones. They're preserved down in our collection spaces. Uh, there's still research being done. So just a few years ago, I had a big uh, grant to help sort through all the micro parts of snow mass. And so I worked with our collections manager, Kristen McKenzie, to pull apart the 30 to 60,000 little tiny bones. And it turns out we probably have closer to 300,000 little tiny bones of things like salamanders and birds, uh, little mammals. And so we're still working through that gigantic pile of teeny tiny bones. Uh, but it's one of the most popular collections in our uh, museum. So we get scientists from all over the world coming to look at our mastodons and look at our sloths. And I think you'll see more research papers coming out of snow mass in the near future. Pretty amazing. Um, for those of you who are asking about summer camps and internship opportunities, please check out our website. There's a whole lot of opportunities for, for y'all to get involved. So make sure that you check that out. Um, and to end us out, Barry, is wondering why T-Rex had such little arms. That is one of the big mysteries in paleontology. So we know that T-Rex used its arms because it has really well-developed muscles. And so you wouldn't have well-developed muscles on something that was useless. And so we know it was using it. We just still don't know what for. So maybe it was used to help push a T-Rex up off of a laying position when they were sleeping on the ground. Maybe it was used somehow during combat or for mating. We just don't know how it was used, but we do know it was used. So that's one thing I can be certain of. Maybe some of the kids in attendance tonight will grow up to discover, to solve that mystery for us. I hope so. <laughs> All right, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sertich. That was a really incredible presentation. Dinosaurs are so cool. You're so cool. Thank you so much. That was excellent. Well, thank you all for joining me. It was really fun to talk dinosaurs. <laughs> all right, good night, everyone. Have a great evening. <laughs>